history of Hannibal. <laughs> um, Hannibal is an interesting little river town as well. Probably the two most historic towns in, in Missouri are, are uh, St. Genevieve, of course, the oldest uh, town, and then Hannibal. Mm -hmm. We do about 70 million a year in tourism, uh, international, and a third of it is Asian. Oh, they love Mark Twain. Oh, well, they still teach Twain in China and Vietnam and all these different places. And then about another third of it is European and the other third is folks from the States. I did Mark Twain at the Outdoor Amphitheater. Huh. Outdoor Amphitheater. Did you? Some 30 years ago. <laughs> so I still do Mark. I am Mark Twain for So, um, uh, 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 oh, the, the great director and actor that did the most famous yeah. movie. Hal Holbrook? Hal yeah. No, no, no. They did the most famous movie in all of history. Uh, Ken, what's his name? Ken Burns? No. No. The one with Jesus in it. Gregory Peck. <laughs> About Twain? No, no, no. no. Ten okay. Commandments? <laughs> We're not going to get that. Yeah. Give us some more clues. Yeah. It's all right. It's all right. Um, Orson Welles. Oh, thank you. Ah, there you go. Okay. That so Orson Welles a wrote a, a radio play called Huck that never was broadcast. And the, one of the guys at the museum that plays Twain got the rights to it, owns it now. And so we do it for all the riverboats. So they bring the riverboats in, and they bring them over to the museum, and we, it's like a live radio drama in front of the live audience. They have old fashioned mics and stuff like that. No Martians? No All right, War of the Worlds. <laughs> and, so, and so this guy is like really good at playing Twain. He calls me up and says, you want to be in the show? And I said, can I be one of the scallywags down on the uh, river? He said, no, you have to be Twain. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. This is Avery back here. Raise your hand. Avery is one of my apprentices. And uh, one or the other travels with me when I go on the road. So he'll be helping us out and running around all day. Stuff done. Hopefully it won't rain too much. Um, I am originally, I was born in St. Louis and raised in Des Moines, Iowa. Oh. Uh, is that good or bad? Don't Moines, ask her. Des Moines is one of the most progressive <laughs> cities in the country that nobody has. Everybody thinks Iowa is very conservative. Uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, let's put it to you this way. We, in third grade, we had to read Hunt Finn and talk about the racial implications. <laughs> in seventh grade, they brought in the Black Panthers to talk to us about racial equity. Oh my God, that's pretty progressive. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty progressive. Uh, very interesting. My father was a corporate executive. My mother, since World War II, was one of the leaders of the feminist movement and wrote for the New York Times, Washington Post, and Chicago Trib on feminist issues from 1946 until she died in 07. So, so dinner was always interesting in our house because my dad was head of the Republican Party. And I was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> interesting combo. Yeah, yeah, so I go out to the airport uh, with my mom and pick up Bella Abzo to come home. Oh, Bella, I love her and then, and then my dad would take me out to the airport to pick up Barry Goldwater. Oh. <laughs> it was so confusing. <laughs> but it was an interesting. So um, my father told my brother and sisters and I that we should never go into corporate life because they'll suck your soul away. they give you a good living and, and all that, but you'll be miserable all your life. So none of us did. Uh, right you actually followed your parents' advice. I did. <laughs> my brother was a photographer. My sister was a costume designer for Stephen Sondheim, who was a Broadway And um, my little sister was head of cookies for the Girl Scouts of America. She was head of fundraising. <laughs> and then I was supposed to show up at the University of Iowa, and I never showed up. I had a chance to go to Hamburg, Germany and do a four-year apprenticeship with an internationally known furniture maker named Robert Krebsbach. It took me three months once I got there to beg my way into it. He wouldn't even open the door. But I just took the chance, you know, and so he, I did that apprenticeship. I got into preservation very early, so I was uh, had the huge paper routes in Des Moines, and I saved up 10 grand over the years. I was 17, and I was a senior in high school. And I was building sets for the local community theater. And um, a gay couple came up to us, both my other buddy Mark and I, and said, you know, you guys brag a lot about uh, all this money you saved up with your paper. Okay, we should not do that. Okay, I'm sorry. He 
said, no, 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 you should buy our house. We're moving to San Francisco. And this is in 1973. And we said, well, how come we can't buy your house? We're in high school, man, you know. And he said, well, come out and look at it. So we drove out there. Sorry. Let me get rid of that. I got to turn this off. Stop calling me. <laughs> Everybody, Everybody does it when their phone rings. So we went out and looked at it, and I drove up, and it was across the street from a park called Union Park, and I found out later that Teddy Roosevelt had dedicated this park to, to fallen union leaders, because he had a big epiphany about unions as, as, during his pres presidency. He became very pro <laughs> and it was an I didn't know it was called an arts and crafts style house. I didn't know anything. All I knew is that Pella was from in Iowa and made the best windows in the world, <coughs> which is not true. They make the worst windows. In the world. No company makes a worse window than Pella. It used to be a Cadillac. So we and, and looked at it. So I, I, you know, you drive up and it has a cross buck door on the uh, tuck under garage. It's got a wrap around porch with casement windows looking out over the port, over the park. A little balcony above that. You go in beam ceilings with weird stripey stuff in the wood and, and brand new lime green shag carpet and it was going to come with oh. a rake. <laughs> my mom had one of those. I know, oh I'm, I'm like, wow, this is like, this is like really <laughs> groovy, <that>. right? <laughs> and uh, it had built-in china hutch with hardware on it and it looked like somebody had beat it with a hammer and, and pine cabinets in the kitchen. It was really cool. And uh, upstairs, you know, the woodwork was neat, and there was a little scuttle hole in the, in the ceiling. And I said, can we go up in the attic? He said, I know. I've never been up there. So we got a ladder, and I went up in there, and I saw a whole bunch of rolls of wallpaper, like way off on the side. And I thought, well, that might be cool. Maybe that's like original or something. So we grabbed all that, brought it downstairs, <coughs> rolled it out on the kitchen table, and it was the original blueprints. No. And inside the blueprints was a catalog that fell out. It was, had been rolled up in it, and um, it was dog-eared on a page, and we opened it, and there's the house. <laughs> and it was Gustav Stickley's Craftsman Homes, and the oh, prints were wow. signed by Stickley. Oh, wow. Like, oh, Who's this guy? Because <laughs> 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 like, at that time, really, at the library, 73, about the only really good information about preservation was an eight-page, three-hole punch newsletter called the Old House Journal. And today it's a major magazine for old houses, probably the best one in the market. Um, and I thought, wow, this is very cool. So we're in high school, we can't buy it, so we'll, we'll thank you for showing it to us. And he says, no, we'll be the bank. We'll sell it to you for 16 grand. You give us 2,000 down, and you'll have 8,000 left to put in the house. You can rehab it and sell it before you graduate from high school. And we're like, far out. <laughs> So we did it, and uh, we got bids from Pella to replace all the windows. We got uh, bids to get the really wide aluminum siding. In fact, then the wider it was, the cooler you were. You know, the ties. Of, you know, the leisure suits, you know, and all that kind of. And, uh, and it had its original cedar shingled roof from 1904 that was leaking. And, uh, you know, we got bids for a three-tab asphalt shingled roof. You know, we didn't know what we were doing. We got all the bids, and they were like in the mid-20s, and we are like, oh, we're screwed. What are we going to do? So I walked over to one of the windows, the putty's falling out, the ropes were missing. Um, you know, it had those really bad aluminum storms on the outside that, that are barely a one break and break your fingernails off every time you try to lift it up, right? And there was a little bit of rot on a few of them, but nothing serious. And I said, you know, I remember this red can of stuff called DAP, I think it was, and on my dad's bench. And so we went to the hardware store. We got DAP, and then we went to the auto store and bought Bondo. Uh -huh. <laughs> we're going to repair that rock with Bondo. I thought it was brilliant. I had to go back four years after I sold the house and take it all out. <laughs> Bondo bad. DAP even worse. Oh. DAP is the worst glazing putty on the planet. Oh, if you if you paint, I wondered if it was just me. No, <laughs> it was DAP. It like, keeps falling out. I know. I know. So, so DAP. If you paint DAP before 28 days, it will fail. Okay. If you don't paint it before 28 days, it will fail. <laughs> so you're just screwed. And homeowners get, get, right on the turn, turn, uh, homeowners get turned off to window restoration because da they're using DAP. So it's, it's just it's just an interesting thing. So anyway, we, you know, 
pulled the shag carpet back. We had a six pack of beer. We spilled a beer on the floor and went, oh God. So we got some rags and we wiped it up and the finish came off. And we're like, oh my God. <laughs> so we ran to the hardware store and bought like 10 gallons of denatured alcohol and we never put a sander on that floor. We stripped it. It was beautiful white quarter sawn oak. We, we refinished all the woodwork. We fixed the windows. We found a little secret hiding place in the jam. It was like, oh man, man you could use that for a stash. You, know? <laughs> you have to remember we're 17 years old. Right? It was it was right? <laughs> and, um, so, and, and we found out that we could buy the cedar shingles, number one blue label, what we call Corazon uh, uh, or vertical grain the cedar shingles, hardwood, and put it on ourselves right over the original skip decking cheaper than hiring somebody to come in and resheathe the roof and put down asphalt. So we put a cedar shingle roof back on it and copper flashings and, and we repaired all the way. And we got it all done and painted it up instead of siding it. That stucco on the first floor and cedar shingles on the second floor. So put it on the market, call a realtor. And I said, can you, can you get 35 out of it? She said, no, we're going to list it for 82. And Mark and I looked at each other and went, oh, <laughs> for the first day it sold for $85,000. Oh, oh, my God. Young couple with kids. And we go to the bank to close, and we all pass our IDs around the bank. So the banker's like, look, man, you aren't old enough to sign a deed. <laughs> <laughs> go get your parents. And we'll reconvene at 1 o'clock. So Mark and I walked out one. We never told our parents we'd done it. <laughs> oh. And, you know, my dad was living. My dad was six foot ten. And I'm like, Dad, you know, Mark and I bought a house over on the east side. And he's like, what, you little liar? You told your mother you were going to the library and studying, doing all this stuff. You're and you're all over there on the east side rehabbing this crappy old house. And then I told him how much we paid for it and how much money we made. And he walked over and he put his arm around me and said, what a fine capitalist boy you are. <laughs> The point of the story is that I didn't know what we did was preservation, but it was as pure preservation as it gets. Preservation is about preserving and maintaining the built environment. It's about keeping as much original material as possible. <clears throat> I've been involved in and or owned, partnered in over 160 ground up restorations in my life. Rehabilitations is more accurate. Some of them were museum houses, we call those restorations. But the, the, the truth is, in, in all those years, I've never replaced a window, not once. I've never retrofitted a window with double pane insulated glass uh, because for two reasons. I want my buildings to be energy efficient and I want to make a profit on my, on my development projects. I can't do either if I replace the windows. Because that, all we know now, through the last 10 years we've been doing field studies, laboratory studies, working with Berkeley Labs, I'm, I'm one of the founders of this organization. This is a not-for-profit national group sponsored by the National Trust and the Park Service and all the SHPOs around the country, State Historic Preservation Offices, that does, we do testing side by side. Uh, the last one I did was a Marvin window. Y'all heard of Marvin, right? Double pane, low E glass, argon gas, that's a, one of the big scammeroos, boy. Argon gas lasts in those about six months at a time. Um, and uh, we did a side by side. So we took a window, an original window from a 1900 house. We did what we're going to do today to it and put a wood storm on the outside. And we had the Marvin double pane window and we did infrared photography of it. And the Marvin window doesn't even come close. Right. Air infiltration is worse everything. So when we started this organization, we went down to Pine Mountain, Kentucky, which is in the middle of nowhere. So much so that we had to drive 40 minutes to get to a restaurant, and the waitress says, where y'all from? And I'm, I'm, oh, we're up in Pine Mountain. Well, that's in the middle of nowhere. And I said, where the hell are you? <laughs> You're in the middle of nowhere, too. <laughs> it's amazing. But it's a beautiful place, and it was all designed by uh, uh, Mary Hooker from Kansas City. She's a female architect. Her father wouldn't let her go to architecture school, so she ran away from home, went to Paris, graduated number one in her class from an architecture program, came back. Her father was the biggest residential developer in Kansas City. He refused to hire her, so she started her own company. And she designed 20 of the most amazing structures down there. 
everything from uh, a Tudor to German country, timber frame, log, you name it, she, she designed and built it. What time frame was she doing? 1908, 1904 okay. to 1908. Did she do the big mansions in like Mission Hills? Like she did a couple of them. Yeah. And, um, and what it was was Jane Adams was in Chicago. She invented social work as we know it today, and she told two of the, this, this old lesbian couple that thought that the rural kids should have have some help too, because they're starving to death and not learning. And she said, "Fine, I'm busy. You go do it." And they got three mules, rode into the Appalachian Mountains, and found this old hillbilly named Creech. I swear to God, his name is Creech. <laughs> And he gave them Pine Mountain and the valley below to build this settlement school, and then they hired Mary Hooker to do the, uh, the architecture. So that history, from a, a, a woman's perspective, <laughs> to me, is really cool. And we took all these double-hung windows uh, on this one building, and there were like eight of them. One we just left the way it was. The next one we did a little weather stripping on the window sashes with no storm. Then we did one with a wood storm and weather stripping, and then we did weather stripping with an aluminum high grade storm, not like the lumberyard types you see today. And we did one with just an interior air panel, you know, like plastic on the inside, just to see. And we hired the guy that does Marvin Anderson and Pella's major testing. And he comes down, it cost me a hundred grand, I had to raise a hundred grand to hire this guy. And he puts his arm around me and the other founders of this organization and he says, I'm glad to take your hundred grand and I'm going to do all this air infiltration testing for you, but you got to know that the window industry spends hundreds of millions of dollars to create these high-tech windows, and this is going to happen. And I said, look, we hired you to give us data. Whatever the data is, we will publish it in that book. He said, okay. He goes in. He's in there doing all his testing for a day, and he won't come out. And the interns are like sliding food under the door. <laughs> day two, he does a whole other round of testing. Won't come out, won't talk to us. Day three, the end of the summit, he's supposed to give his results at noon. He, does, he gets up at like four in the morning, apparently, and does another full round of testing. He gets out, he hasn't shaved or taken a shower in three days. He gets up in front of everyone. He said, this is the most embarrassing moment of my life. He said, there isn't a single replacement window on the market today that has uh, as low air infiltration as the windows that you weather strip with storm. Is nothing, and the thermal capability of the windows with storms is double what a double pane window is. So that's interesting, isn't it? And I'm like, cool, <laughs> because you know I, I was hoping because, because for years we were all about conjecture and, and preservation in the trades. Yeah, wood storms are good, you know, and, and this and that, and, and and painting properly can get you a 20 year paint. But, but now we do all this testing. And so now we have data, and science does matter, um, even though I think in this world sometimes people don't believe in science, I think we should believe in science, science uh, makes all the difference in the world. So what's the objective truth? The objective truth is that we can take an old window from this house, which was built when, do we know? Very early. Yes, how yes. about that? Er early 1800s, maybe even late 1700s. Um, and we can take that window and make it have less air infiltration than any replacement window on the market. So which, and if they actually put storms on them, uh, they would have the thermal capability. Because when we look at thermal capability of windows, we, for years everybody was talking about R value, right, of a window. So what's better, an R value that's high or low? High. But it was designed to quantify the thermal capability of insulation, not glass. Glass is the worst insulator of any construction material that there is, period. So we went to an English standard called the U value, the letter U. And the lower that is, the better it is. But the difference is a .55 for a crappy window like this. This is, I don't even like to touch this. It, <laughs> they told me it was made with virgin unsexed vinyl. Um, but they, it, it, where so, do vinyl babies come from? Yeah, <laughs> I asked them. You know, they said, well, we can drop them off at your garage if you want. <laughs> um, so, out of the box, a cheap vinyl window is a .55. Uh, .55, right? That's, that's a U value yeah. that you're talking about? Right. Yeah. And, and the most energy efficient windows you can buy today are down around a .30. So, it's really insignificant. 
The Department of Energy quantifies your energy use through lots of studies. And they do a pie chart. And I, I can't do a PowerPoint here, so I'm just going to have to describe it to you. The pie chart, what, what percentage of your energy footprint out of 100% do you think an old window that's rattling, ropes broken, putties falling out, and no storm, what percentage of your energy cost do you think that can be attributed to out of 100%? Anybody? Five percent. Five? Fifteen. Fifteen. Worst case scenario is ten. Wow. <laughs> so it's insignificant to start with. Doors are eleven percent. Stereos and all your electronic equipment equals about thirteen percent. So windows to start with are not as big an issue as the industry makes out. But again, they have hundreds of millions of dollars to market their products, right? And so when we look at this window, one of the things that, that uh, Cardinal Glass, which is one of the biggest uh, what we call float glass manufacturers today, clear glass as we see it today. They did studies, accelerated studies in the lab to see how long the seals between the panes of glass would last. Du single sealed, double sealed, triple sealed, you know, because they're going to have all these seals. One fails, the other one will pick it up. Three to five years is what they determined that the seals fail. So they immediately started putting the spacer strip in between, pass this around, and what do you notice about that spacer strip? What that little aluminum strip? They, there's all kinds of spacer strips. What do you notice about it? They harden and they crack. Well, initially, are those holes go all the way through it? Those little perforations. Those are perforations. That's right. Because the condensation is going to get between the panes of glass. Then they started filling that strip with a desiccant, which is what comes in your pill bottle that absorbs moisture. And that's good for about six, seven years, uh, whether it absorbs moisture or not, and then it's ineffective. So we start to see condensation getting between the panes of, uh, of uh, double pane glass in that, the eight to 12 year range. You start to see that in a lot of windows, not all, but most. <laughs> so when they say it's insulated glass, that's impossible. You can't insulate glass unless you do this. <laughs> this is insulated glass. <laughs> I can tell you a story about my, my wife will love this one because whenever one of the first rental places we were in, I couldn't stand all the drafts and everything that was coming through the window, so I went around and cut a bunch of styrofoam yeah. and, and covered up all of our light. <laughs> all of our lights, the whole house was dark. It was tight though. Yeah. <laughs> So in this in this book, this is available uh, after the class. If anybody's interested, we charge thirty bucks for it. It goes to the not for profit, uh, but the studies are in there and all the best practices for pres uh, window preservation. So this is in every state preservation office, every preservation architect's office. It is the standard that's used for best practices for window restoration. And one of the things that we say in here is. With all due respect to our partner, the National Park Service, we disagree that adding double pane glass to historic windows is a good thing. We don't think it's a good thing. It's too heavy, and it causes uh, can cause structural damage to the windows. And so we don't recommend it. <coughs> and they're 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 getting away from it as well. And they didn't also recommend exterior storms on tax credit projects and uh, national landmark or and or national register properties for years because they said it obscured the divided light muntins. So a muntin is a thing that divides the panes of glass. That's what, It's not a mullion. I have this old lady that calls me up after uh, some blog. I heard you again. You keep calling those things muntins. They're not. They're mullions. And I'm like, so great to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Call me next year. Right. Um, but uh, and I don't care what you do, unless you're doing true divided light muntins in a window. Most of the windows probably around here were six over six and or different variations because glass was too expensive to buy large, in large sheets. My house was built in 1859. Uh, attached to the back of it is an 1830 timber frame cottage that was, uh, is still the oldest house left in hand. Uh, and it still has its original six over six. So we restored all the windows in our house, in the big house. It's, a, it's a, almost a 10,000 square foot Italianate, five story Belvedere uh, Italianate. There was a slum apartment building. And um, we had it all air tested, and the guy was just like completely blown away. He couldn't believe it. It was 
virtually no air infiltration anywhere around these windows. <clears throat> I like to blow these guys away because they're used to it. And all the realtors are like, uh, new vinyl windows could be duplex, right? You know, that's what that's how they market old houses. And they call them Victorians. There's no such thing as a Victorian house. They're Victorian era houses, <laughs> but there are all these different styles within the Victorian era. Uh, so we need to work with realtors too, because they're a big part of all of this. Okay, so insulated glass is not a great thing. Storm windows, we we uh, make all of our own. There are a lot of companies that make storm. This looks like a screen, um, but it has removable panels from the inside. So that once you put the storm up, I recommend taking them down every three to four years to check to make sure there's no rot around your window. But you don't have to take them off every spring and fall. They're a better insulator than any aluminum storm. And when the sash is here, you can't see this. You can get them in different colors. They're, they have a weather stripping on the aluminum channel that fits into a rabbit. And these tested for air infiltration the same as a putty window, which really surprised me. But they're, they're really snug. And... Um, I like to have removable screens and glass from the inside. I don't like the permanent screen on the outside, uh, but it works that way too. And when we do that, we put a 15 degree bevel on the top of this rail and a 15 degree bevel on the bottom of this one so the water sheds off and doesn't get back in here. And these are not that expensive. It's, just, it's astonishing, but they're full through mortise and tenon joints. That means the tenon comes all the way through instead of being blind. A half blind tenon is a pocket for moisture to rot the window and or the storm window. And these are a sacrificial lamb. The Park Service said you, we don't want you to put them on because you can't see the muntins. Can you see the muntins in this picture? <laughs> that is a wood storm. That picture was taken from across the street. Huh? So that's why we put it on the front of here. Because we love the Park Service. <laughs> you know, sometimes they, you know, they have some really great people. I train all the National Park Service preservation personnel and I get to pick a park every year and so I was in Sequoia last time. I actually have a picture of me hugging a Sequoia tree. I look like an ant taking a piss on it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, anybody have any questions about anything that I've said so far? Yes sir. Where do you get the hook kits for the tops of the uh, storm windows? Say it a little louder. Where do you get the hook kits for the top? Oh, for the, for the top hangers? Yeah, I don't like the new ones they have. I like the old yeah. wide ones. Yeah. Killianhardware.com. This is all going to be on your, there, there's some handout. I don't, how are you handling that? So I did share everything via Dropbox, but if you did not get it. Yeah, but if we could open that. Yeah. Oh. If you did not get it, uh, give, put your email on here, sign up today, and I'll email that out to everyone also. But it's a very large the window, document. The window, <laughs> it, 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 you can't email it. It's too big. I think so. No. So okay, it's probably, what is it? A hundred? It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I tried to yeah. show it. <laughs> That's why I always tell my clients, don't print this off. <laughs> my God, well, I have to waste four trees. This to do is it. the document. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, everything you ever wanted to know about windows is in there. No, that's prison documents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but please sign up and I'll email you to come to City Hall and I will maim a tree for you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're here because you want to learn how to restore an old window and how to weather strip one. So I'm, I'm, I always feel like I'm talking to the choir a little bit, but I think some of this data is important and that, uh, you know, we can live by myth and we can live by the marketing and be sheep, or we can do a little research and find out that, whoa, old windows are, are a precious resource that can be repaired. In 2019, $9.5 billion in the replacement window industry. Now, that's, that's a lot, right? Is that worldwide? Or? No, it's just in the U.S. You extrapolate that out to how many sashes that ends up, that's about 112 million window sashes that ended up in the dump in 2019. We're I'm waiting for the new data to come in for 2020. It's going to be, actually, I was thinking it would be less, but people have been doing all kinds of work during the pandemic. So, um, so if you extrapolate that out, it's about 112 million window sashes. That's a lot. And 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, that was all the original windows in these houses were ending up in the dump. Here's what's really bizarre. 
is that about half of those windows that are ending up in the dump today are less than 20 years old. And sometimes they're the second round of replacement yeah. already. And, we're, <laughs> right, and it's just happening everywhere we go. I mean, this is, it, it, and our landfills yeah. are about 40% yeah. filled with demolition debris right now. And they can't handle much more of it. So, um, my whole life is about finding information. And uh, <coughs> that's what makes it fun for me. Um, we're going to go over and we're going to take a look at this one. And what we're going to do is we're going to break up into two teams. So if you, on a scale of one to five, five being the highest skill level, three being medium skill level, and one being like no skill at all. If you're a, if you're a four or five, raise your hand. One, two, okay. All right, so I need you to be on this team. This is team two, you're team one. And uh, one other guy that has good skills, come over here. One of you two guys really appreciate it. Okay, so how many people do we have total? One, two, three, four. What, what's the number? What? On your skill level. All right, so I need, I need, okay, yeah, this is your team right here. And this is your team right here. You guys are team one. Team one's going to do the bottom sash. Team two's going to do the upper sash. And we don't have, we have one piece of cylinder glass. Everybody know what cylinder glass is? Nope. Okay, so there were two ways to make glass in the early days of this country. One was called crown glass where they would blow, they would spin a large crown of glass and then they would cut it into small squares for the six over six or eight over whatever. And the other way was, uh, that came a little bit later, uh, just after the turn of the uh, uh, 1800s, is cylinder glass. So in the early days, like at Mount Vernon, all their glass, I work at George Washington's Mount Vernon, I've restored all the windows there. And the way that they did it is they blew a large cylinder of glass and then they lay it on a, on a metal platen and slid it down the middle and lay it over. And it had arsenic and rat hairs and lead in it and everything, and it was very impure and that's why it's wavy. It doesn't get thicker as it gets older. It doesn't sag, that's, a, that's an urban legend. I, I bought into it for years until I, I, I talked to a, a chemist at a glass company. He's like, that's, that's the biggest bunch of bull I ever heard in my life. It, it was just an imperfect process. We have modern float glass in three of the four panes, and the one that is the old cylinder glass is already broken before we even got it. So our buddy here uh, that does window restoration and, and makes new windows is going to get us some old glass um, so that we can put uh, cylinder glass back in these windows, which is very cool. Huh. I don't often get that in the communities I go to, so it's nice. Um, and uh, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to split up into two teams. A couple of quick things. Uh, people weighing about weights, right? Ropes, weights, and pulleys. This has been around for tens of thousands of years. The idea of a counterbalance has been around forever. It's the best way in the world to raise a lower window. The problem with most old windows is that even after you rehab them, if you don't do the kind of weather stripping that we're going to do, they're sometimes hard to get cocked and they're hard to get up and down. If we do our job right, these windows will operate with one thing, maybe two, just one, um, and stop all the air infiltration around them. Um, just to some show of you my example. windows on a hundred year old building have chains. Chains, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Some buildings. Uh, would that be a, original? I, that would, it yeah, they have to have a here. bigger, heavier duty pulley. Okay. And yeah. um, uh, some commercial buildings after 1900 especially um, were uh, had chains. But most had ropes. How old's your building? 1905. Yeah. Right. It was a classic po point in time when that happened. This is an upper sash. So, one of the things that we do is when this upper sash is up in place, it's an air infiltration spot here. So we actually put in a, a, a rubber gasket material here. It's hollow tube. It can conform to the irregularities in an old house very nicely. I've gone back 20, 25 years later and it's still pliable, still doing its job. If it got torn or ripped or something happened, you give this a hard pull, it comes right out of the little slot that we'll create and you can replace it so it's repairable. Then where the meet, where the windows meet in the middle, it's called the meeting ring, okay? 
that's a, where the sash lock is. That's a really big air infiltration spot. And the way we get around that is we put a rubber gasket at the meeting rail. So when the sash lock is locked, it pulls the two meeting rails together against the rubber. It doesn't hurt the sashes, they're, they're small slots. They can be filled in if somebody wanted to go back and have their windows operate really tough and not be weatherized. They can do that. <laughs> Outside of 10. <laughs> hmm? Outside of 10. Friction fit. Oh. We take a, a special putty knife that we, uh, that we uh, created uh, that, that friction fits it into the slots. And Avery's an expert at it, aren't you, Avery? Don't smile, Avery. <laughs> <laughs> he, doesn't, he, doesn't he, he hasn't been around this many adults in his whole entire life. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, and then at the bottom of the bottom sash, where it meets the sill area, that's another vulnerable spot that we put rubber gaskets in. And then on the side, what we do is this has been around. So my house, 1859, 1859 windows in 1903 was retrofitted with this exact same weather stripping system. And this is what's in my house. This is the little track system that was built. Sashes to slide up and down on the track. Now today, it's slicker, it's made with zinc, it's got little ribs on it, so very little of it touches the actual wood, so that it's, it slides so slick, it's just crazy, it's just really nice, and, and they're, only, they're not very deep, so you don't have to go very deep into the sash, so that stops all the air infiltration around the sides, all the air infiltration at the top of the top sash, where the sashes meet, and at the bottom, and that's the system, it's really simple, and it's about $40 worth of weather stripping for an entire boat. So you, you don't even, I'm going to show you worst case scenario today. Uh, we're going to take a window with lots of lead paint, and we're going to grind it up and put it in our sandwiches for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around lead paint all my life. They say that I'm that considered a, <laughs> They say that I'm considered a lead worker. And you can have a level of 20 to 25 as a lead. Well, that's when you have a stroke. Right, so most of the people in my industry run a level of six to nine, and a normal male adult will run four to seven, just without ever being around any lead, just from the environment. And I usually run about an eight, and um, uh, which is really low for, for the business. But I, and I get tested every year, and I've been around because if you mind me today, you won't get you won't get dosed. If you don't mind me, you will. So just so. You know. That's why you have to have a respirator. Right? Um, all right. Each team has a toolbox. We're only going to take one of them. We're going to take team one's toolbox with us. Uh, we need a vac, probably. We're going to take that HEPA vac and put it in there, plug it in. It's, there's a table there, and there's an outlet underneath it. Before you guys get started, I'll let you know it's my tea place. My yeah, please tell us here. all about it. <laughs> you guys can use my restroom if you need to. And all of you can get a free sample of either of the teas that I have. Oh, sample of oh, like thank you. <laughs> There's also a bathroom right through this door straight in. Right? There's also a bottled water over here. Oh, if nice. This one's the most expensive. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for letting us use your house to do this. No problem. It's, it's really important. It's exciting. Yeah. I wish I could participate. <laughs> You gotta run a business, I get it. Right, well, kind of. Yeah. I get to drink tea. <laughs> so, track system and, and, and everything that I was describing, it started in 1893 is when it was patented. And uh, so, a lot of arts and crafts era houses in 1930 had it installed in their windows when they were new. Right. And it had interlocking metal at the meeting right here. It gets all bent and all these goobers. And goober is a and uh, so that's why we went to rubber and the same thing on the bottom and top you know it was just they paint these little pieces of metal that came out it was just a knife so one of the things that we use a lot uh, uh, when we're taking windows out is water and the reason we do is because we don't want to suck lead dust uh, it's very important uh, this is the window that we're going to do uh, several things about it that you can see from the outside the uh, bottom rail has dropped here on the upper sash. We've got what we call a divided light muntin. This is a vertical muntin. Uh, bottom rail putty's falling out. I mean, you can just 
yeah. it's just falling out. So it should be pretty simple. Here's the only piece of cylinder glass in the whole thing, and you can see it's cracked. Now, we're going to take that out and try to get it out whole because, for me, I would use it in a 6 over 6 light. So I have thousands of window sashes. So the vinyl pirates, these are the guys that put in vinyl windows, they drop off on the back of my garage 40 sashes a week because they don't have to take them to the dump. <laughs> so my wife is like thinks I'm a hoarder. <laughs> we cut into those sashes. We just put them on a uh, miter box and cut the at a 45. The top corners, the sides come out, the glass comes out, and then we can cut it to whatever. We can use it. Um, so that works out really well. Avery, uh, this was painted shut horribly, mm -hmm. and uh, this upper sash. And Avery's come around and scored it in my ear. <laughs> when a window sash is painted shut. What we can do is take this tool, this is called a window zipper, and you can buy these at the hardware store for five or six bucks. And they have very sharp little blades right here. Right. Well, you have a name store here, I saw it coming. Uh, yeah. This is just made by Hyde, which makes all kinds of you know, interesting tools. Um, I need to get this curtain off of here. Okay. So what we have on this, uh, these are called interior stops. They create the outside stop for a window. Then you have another stop that separates the upper from the lower, and that's called a parting stop. It parts the windows from each other in here. Um, we have interior ones. This has a molding profile. I, I sort of, what's the date of this house? I think it's 1822. Okay, so these would be original. This would be an original profile. In houses that were that date to the mid 1800s and, and before, you would not see a molded profile like this in general. Usually, just a bevel instead of a double OG or whatever, like you see here. Um, we have the pulleys up here. This actually has one rope and it's got paint all over it. So, one of the things that we found doing research over the last 35 years on ropes. I, 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 I was lucky because I, I used to do a national television show on PBS and it cost two million a year, part, about half a million of that went into testing. So that was fun because I had all this dough to do all this testing. And so we've tested ropes over the years. Now, for a long time we used nylon sash cord and, and of course original sash cord was cotton. And what we found is that the nylon deteriorates faster than the cotton. The UV light breaks it down more, and I'm, I'm all excited because I'm thinking, good, cotton is like a natural plant. I'm like, it takes more energy to make cotton and sash cord than it does nylon. Um, even though it's not using all the oil, it still <laughs> takes more energy to make it. So if you're looking at that angle, and some people don't care, and <clears throat> I do, so um, that's why I talk about it. Um, so we use cotton rope with a nylon core. Because the nylon it gives it a lot less stretchiness, yeah, yeah. and so, um, it, but it's not exposed to the UV light. The problem is, is that when you get paint on cotton cord like this, it rots it away in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So um, we always say, if you're going to paint your jam up here, that's the frame that when it goes up and down, pull your rope away before you do it, and uh, that way you're not going to get paint all over. There's another uh, thing called a Pullman balance. I'll show you. I forgot to show you that. That's a looks like a pulley, but it's got a, a spring inside of it and a tape that comes down. And um, in a lot of early uh, Greek revival brick houses, 1830s and 40s and 50s in Hannibal, they didn't have any kind of sash pulley system in them. They had little spring folds, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were they would make a hole for the Pullman and then they would chisel out the brick behind it and put the Pullman in. It looks like a pulley, but it uh, actually uh, doesn't have to have a, a cavity because there's a spring in the barrel of the pulley itself, which is kind of an interesting thing. So my 1845 Greek Revival slave house, the front of it had that retrofitted with, with a Pullman in 1893 and I just replaced it. So I would call that pretty sustainable. <laughs> and the Pullman Company still makes the exact same. Oh, no, no. kidding. <laughs> so the first thing we have to do is we have to get the interior stops off. Now these are not very fancy. My guess is that these are not original. 
based on this molding profile, you would generally see this having the same type of profile, but we're still going to be careful and get it off. So, uh, you need a couple of things. Um, you need to get that ladder. All right. I'm not going to do this for you because people are going to have to get up and do this. This is a hands-on class. I'm just going to demo for you real quick. I'm going to take these two tools and this bottle of water. The reason that we do this, we don't soak it, we just mist it. And the reason we do that is because if there's any old lead paint under the latex that's on here, we don't want to have it in our lungs and if it's wetted down, it doesn't get into the air. So, this is the, this tool. And you can use this nice and flat and score that paint line. Or, you can use the utility knife. You lightly score it to start with. And then you can go a little harder. And then you go a little bit harder. And then you come on the back side of it and do the same thing. And then you go all the way down to the bottom on each side. So who wants to do this on the first? Who wants to be the first victim? Because if you don't volunteer, I'm going to pick you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that stop is just surface mounted on that. Yes, it's, 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 there's right? no it's not no room, no rabbit, nothing like that. Oh, okay. Let me get this tool out of the way. Now the parting stop, the one between the lower and upper sash, is in a groove. And what we call rabbit. Okay, get up on the ladder. Gotcha. Now, you play it. I started to score. Score it one more time on that left side. It's already been misted. That's right. Put, put the blade out all the way. There you go. And just bring it down. Okay, go down as low as you can go. Okay, now you can come on the back side of it a little bit. You just score it a little bit. Yeah, just like that. It takes a little finesse to kind of get your hand in there. Since we don't have the original interior stops, we're just going to keep these and put them back in. We'll actually strip them. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to be able to go even to primer today. There's no way in a one-day class. Mm -hmm. So we're going to strip the sashes. We're going to pull the glass. We're going to re-bed the glass. We're going to re-putty the glass. Mm -hmm. We're going to route the, the weather stripping slots. And then we'll put them back in by the end of the day. It's all new sash cords. And hopefully the weights are in there. <laughs> Get all the way down. Now you can... Now you're going to take I got this one. Yeah, you can go ahead and Did you get it all the way down? Down to the bottom? Yep, all the way down to the to what people call a sill, but an interior sill is called a stool. And I think the reason they came up with it is because everybody was sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> when they were watching. Now, on my porch railings, I make the pitch on the top of my railing so severe that if you sit on it, you're so I come in through the back side here with this little pry bar, and I kind of work it in behind that. And then I, because I don't want to dent this okay. wood. Oh, okay. So that's, that's why, why I have duct tape on here as oh, well. So and then I have to make okay. sure I don't hit the glass. Oh, that. Yeah. See there? Okay, so I got that out enough that I can now get underneath it and start to put it off. Oh, great. Oh, great. No. Yeah. You want to try to find no, where the nail the is. We try to pry where the nail is. That's your, your best shot. Okay. Yeah. So now that's off. And oh my goodness, I was wrong. These are cut nails. Wow. Yeah. How about that? Wow. So it was simple, right? They put a simple stop on the inside. I mean, it could have been added in later. Uh, they quit using cut nails, so cut nails were really prominent up to about 1900, and then wire nails were taking over. But there were some guys that just wouldn't get, they still wanted to buy their barrel of cut nails. And, uh, so we use a lot of Sharpies, and we take the Sharpie and we write, we're going to say, call this window number one, because it's the only one we're doing, right? And we're going to say, 
that this is the left side, and then we're going to put an arrow the to the top. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We have 41 more, Mr. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> we just did, uh, Avery just finished. Uh, Avery ran uh, half of this job by himself because my other apprentice had to take a medical leave. Uh, 14 openings in uh, Queen Anne in Mexico, Missouri. And he did all the work himself, all, all virtually by himself, and just kicked butt. I'm so proud of him. Avery's 17 years old. And he's out running a job. You own the first house yet? So, yeah, I was going to say. He wants me to pay him enough so he can buy a house. Right? Uh, okay, I, so somebody else needs to come up here and do this other uh, interior stop. And that's going to be you. Because nobody raised their hand. So you do it light so you don't get off course the first time and then you go back up and score it a little deeper. And, and we have vacs out there that are also HEPA filtered. This HEPA vac is very expensive. They're about eight, nine hundred bucks. They don't, they wouldn't suck a, a zit off a flea. <laughs> they hate them, right? So we figured out a way to filter sh uh, commercial shop vacs. Oh, not, not homeowner shop vacs, but six plus horsepower commercial shop vacs with a filtering system and we took what comes out the port on uh, uh, um, wipes and sent it to a lab and said, well, you know, which one had the, <coughs> the least coming out the, the back port? And it's, it's those shop vacs with the other oh, filters awesome. were better than what the awesome. EPA says I should be using. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just drag this with me just in case the EPA shows up. Okay. <laughs> and you just want to be gentle when you're prying so that you're not damaging things. Put a little duct tape on the heel of it helps. You know. Do you back your pry bar sometimes with a little shim to keep from... Sometimes, but the, the, the duct tape helps. Oh, yeah. A lot. Of, you know, amazing. Oh, that's what you're doing <coughs> now. Yeah, now. Right. Okay, now you got to mark it. Put that back in my pocket. You know. what was that so number one, right and arrow to the top. We mark everything. Uh, you know, when you're doing a... a 14 windows, you, you got to keep track, you got to give a designation, but what we always find is we give the designation and there's Roman numerals on the side yeah. That, yeah. that they put in when they first installed them so they know what opening was. Yeah. 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 Olive, so we knew that was going to What I want you to do, you have to lift this up so it clears this, and I want you to pull this up. <laughs> Tilt it. There you go. Now we have a rope in the side, and I'm sure it's going to be as a nail in it. No! Yay! I have a nail in the Okay. So this is window number one. Never paint the side of a window sash for two reasons. It gums up when it goes up and down, and if moisture gets in, windows can you know could swell and it gives it places for the moisture to come out of the tenants. Full through mortise and tenon, see there, that's how we used to do them in the old days. And you, you'll see that, that there's one coming through there as well. Uh, really nicely made, and this is our bottom sash, so I write number one bottom. And then I'm curious to see if this tenon comes all the way through, and it, it doesn't appear that it does. There are also little holes here from the manufacturer of the windows. And we don't plug those up because if moisture gets on the rail, then it can come through those little spots. We do paint the bottom rail, but uh, as, at, at a minimum prime it. Um, but this is, you know, fantastic window. I love it. Now, the one part that always flummoxes people the most is getting the parting stop out. And it can be a bear sometimes. But I'm misting all this. Because you don't want the dust, right? Alright, so this is different. This goes into a groove. So when we're scoring this, we don't score it like we did on this one like this. We score it like this. Does that make sense? Well, as close to like this as you can. So we score it like that. And then on the window side, we're going to do this. Let me come over here so people can see it. Yeah. And just score it. You hold this flat to the sash, yeah. and then it cuts a, cuts a line all the way down. 
on, on the lower portion of it, you just go like this and like this. And then that one. Sure. Yeah, so we're going to bring it up. All right. What is that word called? It's the parking stop. You can literally buy that material called a part stop at Lowe's out of their molding bin. Wow. Yeah. Now we make it. But I bring, <laughs> I show you a lot of things that are easily found. So we bought this stuff at Lowe's, and I'll show it to you. And we'll, we'll compare it to the thickness. If it's a little, we don't want it as tight. Because we want this, instead of being a painted in and usually nailed element, we want, we're going to screw it in with, with slotted brass screws, three of them, mm -hmm. so that it can easily be taken out to repair the window. Everything that we do, we want it to be repairable. And so we don't use Phillips screws. Why? What's wrong with Phillips screws? Well, Phillips screws weren't invented until after World War II. <laughs> Quarter inch laminated glass, that's what's in your windshield, approaches the U value of insulated, uh, I can't say insulated, double paned windows. And it has 99.7% UV protection with no black eye low E coatings on them. And it's more soundproof than insulated glass and it costs less. And the problem was it was double the weight of what the original window. So I, we had 12 pound weights in there, and the windows ended up weighing 48 pounds. <laughs> so he did not want the upper sash to operate. So I took a grinder and I put a little groove around all both sashes, and I wired them together. Now that opening has two sash weights wired together that are exactly the weight they need hmm. and the original weight sashes are still in the pocket if somebody ever wanted to go back to regular glass because we, we talk about this in the preservation a lot it's called reversibility if you're going to do something can it be reversed you know do no harm it's that kind of a thing so uh, uh, very important so that was a solution you know similar uh, similar to what you were doing. So one of the things that in a class like this, we're all, we can't do a, a set, a jam, jam restorations in a day and that kind of thing, but the jams are in actually pretty good shape here. That's the, what we call the frame. It goes around. So the sides of a window sash are called styles. That's a Greek term for side. Um, probably, maybe be Latin for all I know, but it means side. Rails are pretty simple. I just think of railroad tracks when I'm describing it to people that are horizontal. Now I'm going to take a flat bar like this and I come up on the corner. And it's really important. We want to keep it flat to the jam. We don't want to go in straight. We want to come up on a corner like this. And I'm going to miss it one more time in case it's dried out a little bit, right? Halfway. <laughs> yeah, there are nails in it, that's for sure. Now, there's a little notch in the meeting rail here so that, that it can slide past there. It's a little tough to get it out there sometimes. So always come up flat and then up on a corner. The one part of a window oh, okay. that is not something that we. Now, gonna, if I'm working at George Washington's Mount Vernon, we're saving it. <laughs> so, how so, you so, so we get into the main that. house. And I, I'm up on, I, we set up scaffolding on the big, gigantic, arched top Palladian spider window, and I looked at the pulleys, and I'm like, oh my god, the pulleys are wood. Wow. The barrel was made out of white English Coruscant oak. And the pulleys were turned on the lathe out of applewood. Wow. And he had to order them from England because nobody in the States made them. Oh my God. I mean, that kind of stuff is just so a treasure. How would, yeah. how would you more delicately approach what you're doing right there? Well, <laughs> I'm being pretty delicate. So the problem is right here. Right. So if I, if I want to be more delicate, which my wife would tell you I've never been. <laughs> and you want to try to pry it out like that, and then you can come and take this right here, 
and pry it out like this. Yeah, because that paint in that top stash can really get behind there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. glue oh, that yeah. together for... Got it out of hole and wire nails. So this has been out before and somebody put wire nails in it. We want to keep that because we'll use it to get the thickness for our new pieces. So. The original ones on this wouldn't have been nailed in. They would have been cut with three degree angle and slipped in, correct? Sometimes, but sometimes they used to cut nail in them too in the really early ones. I don't know. You know, um, that 1830s uh, timber frame cabin on my lot, there's, there's no cut nails on the wood side. It was stuccoed over the wood side. Okay, that's a lot of nails. <laughs> They're all rosehead nails, which are made one at a time by a blacksmith, just like at Mount Vernon. Okay, so you want to come in with your, you want to come in here like this, with this yeah. right here like that, up in a corner, gotcha. and just beat it into the get wood. A little bite. Yeah, get a little bite. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Keep it flat. Very difficult when it's all painted shut like that to get them out. That's why we replace them. So. All right. Now the trick is, and this is where um, we either get lucky. Or not. I cheated and had Avery go out and cut the paint line on the outside. Of it. But you can take a wooden block and set it right here in a dead blow hammer like this that one there, and you can tap this all the way around. And that usually breaks 90% of the time the paint line on the outside. Oh. Um, oh, I just you got to go through with a ladder? You don't even have to score it on the outside. Okay. Uh, but it's usually painted shut, sometimes caulked shut here. And just tapping that wooden block will loosen that, that, that paint on the outside and it'll come out. Here's that wood block I was telling you about. You just put it on the frame and tap it around and that'll loosen the outdoor. So we never, I never, do any window work on the outside. I always do it. Oh, okay. Okay. Pushing this down. I always grab it right here. I never want to pull down. I want to go like this. Look at that. Now it's painted shut at the top. But it's coming down. Still has both of its ropes. Now these ropes are probably original and made out of hemp. So get your pipe out. <laughs> so you have to pull this out and pull the ropes out. Somebody want to step up and do that? Who hasn't stepped up so far? Okay. Well, you're the window guy anyway. side casings on. Um, what, these, this white molding here on the inside? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, which is unfortunate. So it, should. so it should be right here. Yeah, they like separate pieces. Right? Yeah, it's a little piece that fits in with a screw, mm -hmm. and then you can take the weights in and out. Oh, wow. We're not going to have that luxury. So, what we need to do and we need to do this now because we need to very carefully score this so that when this comes off, it doesn't pull paint off the wall. You with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the way up here. And we have we have a pass load of finish gun that we can put it back up. You're just scoring at a 45 degree angle right here. And you want to do it lightly. You can do the part you can reach and somebody else can get up and do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Just because it's simple. <laughs> it's just my ponytail. <laughs> now paint pulls up at the bottom of these, okay? So we need to score it here as well. Do Which 
Can I have a spray bottle, please? I rarely run into this. Uh, mostly in Oklahoma and Kansas, there was a window maker who specifically didn't have weight pockets so that every time your rope broke, you had to replace your window. So built-in obsolescence has been around a long time. <laughs> This is casing and trim. Casing and trim. Score this other piece of trim, please. What ladder? Well, you already scored one side, right? So let somebody else. No, she didn't oh, do oh, anything. Oh, oh. <laughs> so reach up as high as you can at a 45 degree angle, lightly come down, 45 degree angle, be about like that. Yeah, just lightly, all the way down to the stool or the wheel, interior stool. Avery will come in and back all this up as soon as we get done. Now, in, in a normal situation, I would cut uh, a weight pocket back into this, but we just don't have the time to do that. Oh, okay. It's a little tricky because what, what would you do? I mean, we're going to put this back. It'll be fine for another 30 years, but... It'll be somebody else's problem. You know, you know <laughs> yeah. But if I was doing all the hot windows in this house, we would pop off the casings, we would cut weight pockets, and put little screws in so that people could access them in the future. All right, who's going to gonna pry it off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill, go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did that one not get scored? No. Oh, I'm not as concerned about that. No, it's an exercise. <laughs> We're going to be using infrared heating devices from Sweden to remove the paint. So I was in Sweden 25 years ago, and I see this guy stripping paint off the outside of his house so fast it was too much. No. With an infrared heating device. Oh, it's not the same. Oh, God, no. Heat gun, heat gun is an automatic prescription for lead poisoning. Lead becomes a toxic vapor at 640 degrees. 
Heat guns usually run 8 to 1,200 degrees. So if you want to get lead uh, poisoned, uh, you know, people do it without their respirators all the time. It's just insane. These infrared heating devices don't heat at over 540 degrees. They blow paint off by vaporizing a tiny minute amount of the, of the resin in the wood that creates this like expansion under the paint film. It helps blow it off the molding profiles oh. and the flaps. Would it work on the paint over brick? Soft no, brick? Because the brick absorbs yeah. the heat. Yeah, the idea is to get the wood cut, not the paint. Right. Good. Good so it's not vaporizing. I know, it's like, like, I'm hey, so you'll smell it's paint. The wood. It, 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 it's wood warming resin. the wood it's enough so that you'll get the touch. Yeah. Uh -huh. My big concern when I first saw this was. You know, the resin keeps the wood pliable, and I think, but it's you know, like 100 to 1,000 percent of the, some infinitesimal amount of paper. Uh, They're available online from a woman-owned company, uh, Catherine Brooks. This is all on your, on your uh, handout sheet. Catherine Brooks is called uh, echostrip.com, echo-strip.com. And she sells them, and she has two variations. She has the big one that looks like a loaf of bread, and the canal, and we have the cold one. Little handheld one. Now these are interesting because these pulleys are actually, if you look at them, they, they look like they're scallop. Come up and take a quick look at them real quick. Um, and they would take what's called a Forzner bit and drill one, two, three holes, and that would be the mortise. They're re really unusual little pulleys. Now outside of a class like this, we would pull the pulleys. We would boil them in a crock pot. That takes all the paint off and leaves the original patina. Hmm. And, you boil them in? Yeah. Uh, water. Yeah. You can buy crock pots at yard sales for nothing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I used to go up on my wife's six burner, like, you know, wolf stove, and uh, she's like, no, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? 